Welcome um, to this uh, new course on introducing Buddhism. Uh, the society runs the course uh, consecutively about three or four times a year. Uh, and uh, so this is the autumn one. Lavinia, sorry, can I just ask you to show slide, the first slide on, on screen share? Uh, so there are seven talks uh, in the course and the topics are on the screen now, if you want to look through it. Um, so today we'll be talking about what Buddhism is and Buddha's life story. Next week, so the, the, the course will run every Tuesday at 6.30 uh, for seven weeks. So next week on Tuesday, we will talk about three signs of being and three fires. These are three signs of being are characteristics that every phenomena, physical or mental, uh, possesses. Uh, and three fires are really what causes us our problems. Uh, the third week is Four Noble Truths, which is the core teaching of Buddhism. And on the fourth week, we will cover Noble Eightfold Path which is the, in fact, the fourth of the four noble truths. The week five is wheel of life, karma and rebirth. Here we talk about why we happen to be in a particular state that we are in, you know, happy or sad or suffering. Um, and uh, Buddhism explains it, that it doesn't just come about um, willy-nilly, there, uh, there is some something that's operating underneath uh, that uh, brings it about, and we'll be talking about that. Sixth week is the parameters. Uh, we'll be talking about development of the original Buddhism into, uh, uh, into a new school of Mahayana. And the seventh week, uh, we'll be talking about meditation. Uh, let me know if you could Put up the sl a second slide, please. Okay, so in, if you wanted to uh, read a little bit about uh, around it, the books I recommend are on the screen. It's Living Buddhism by Mio Kioni. And if you were to get one book, that's the one that I, I would recommend, Living Buddhism by Mio Kioni. Um, I checked Amazon, it's not available on Amazon, but the society does have it on its website, so you can order it through the society website. Um, the, uh, uh, the other books, uh, Buddha's uh, Ancient Path and Spectrum of Buddhism are good ones as well, but uh, I checked and I think that they're difficult to find at the moment and the society library is not open. So I think uh, Living Buddhism is the one you want to get if you want to read about Buddhism. Also, um, if you emailed the society uh, after, uh, after this talk is finished, uh, um, if you email the society with the title line in, uh, introducing Buddhism and give your details, um, they will put you on a, a section of the society that uh, people who are attending this course can access. And there will be my notes that you can lo look at. And um, I think looking at my notes uh, sh should in itself be sufficient for the time being, um, if you can't get hold of any of the books. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so if, if you want to access that, then uh, just send an email to the society and that, that, that'll give you log, login details for the course, uh, which will give you access to the, no, to, to the notes. My notes are rather rough and ready. I, I made them for my own purpose, uh, but uh, um, uh, you know, I was told that it will be uh, useful to other people. So um, you know, you'll have access to it, but do excuse the fact that they are a little bit rough and ready. Okay, so um, just going back, um, uh, so Buddhism was started two and a half thousand years ago by Buddha uh, from his quest to answer the question why we suffer and the way out of suffering. And he was born as a prince uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, 
sorry, he, he was born as a prince uh, and his father was Sudodhana who ruled over Sakyans in uh, uh, a place called Kapilvastu, which is on the borders between Nepal and uh, India. And Buddha's mother was called Queen Maya. There is a custom which is still followed in India uh, that when a woman is pregnant, she goes to her maternal home to give birth. Uh, so it was when Queen Maya was traveling from Kapilvastu to Devadaha, which is where her maternal home was, that the child was born en route prematurely in a place called Lumbini. And very shortly after the birth, Queen Maya died. And in fact, it was Queen Maya's sister, Mahaprajapati, who brought up the child as her own. So yeah, so that slide shows Lumbini, uh, the place where Buddha was born. Uh, so some of these places that we'll talk about are on the Buddhist pilgrimage circuit. And uh, so this is one of the places on the Buddhist pilgrimage circuit of Lumbini where Buddha was born. Um, as was the custom at the time, the king summoned eight wise men to choose a name for the child and to tell the baby's future. And in fact, this tradition is also still followed in um, India uh, where um, you know, people get someone to give babies future. And in fact, you know, if they have arranged marriages, you know, you know, this is consulted. Um, so so this, consul, uh, this custom is still live in India. So, um, so the king had summoned eight wise men to choose the name. Uh, uh, and uh, the prince was called Siddharth. Um, his family name was Gautam, so he was Siddharth Gautam, Prince Siddharth Gautam. And to clarify, the name Buddha means an awakened or enlightened one. So the name Buddha is used after he achieved enlightenment. Till then, he is Prince uh, Siddharth. Gautam. So the eight wise men pronounced that the child had one of two possible futures. One future could be that he would become a Chakravartin, which is a great world emperor. But the other possibility was that he may renounce the world, become a mendicant, and then he would become a fully enlightened Buddha who will, who will lead countless beings to salvation. Now the king on hearing these two possible futures was determined that the prince should become his heir and should um, you know, inherit the kingdom and become a ruler uh, eventually and that he should not give up the kingdom for a homeless life of an ascetic. So in order to achieve this, he made sure that the prince wanted for nothing. The prince was surrounded in refinement and luxury. And you know, his father thought that this will ensure that the prince will remain in the worldly life and will not choose to be an ascetic. He was given education and uh, training to become a ruler. He was married to a beautiful princess, Yasodhara. He had three palaces and lacked nothing, living amongst song and dance, luxury and pleasure, and not really knowing about sorrow. And he was confined to the palace because the 
King wanted to ensure that the, that, that, uh, the prince should not see anything that might start his quest for, uh, for a religious life or, or become a mendicant. And he thought by confining him to the palace, sheltering him from you know, the ugly sights of the, uh, of the village, uh, uh, he will protect the prince uh, th this way. Yet, the king's efforts um, to hold the prince bound to his pleasures uh, were to no avail. Um, the uh, curiosity overtook the prince, and one occasion, the prince convinced his charioteer to take him to the town. And when he was uh, in the town, to his amazement, he saw what he had never seen before, and that was an old man who was weakened and decrepit with age. So he turned to his charioteer and asked what sort of a person this was, and he was told that it was a case of aging and infirmity, and that this fate awaited everyone. And the prince was deeply disturbed on hearing this. Now, here, let's take a pause in the story. Now, here we have the prince who was being trained to become a world ruler. And yet, you know, it seems curious, doesn't it, that he, he was surprised by seeing an old man. I think we can assume that, you know, he had complete education. So, uh, you know, we can assume that he had known about old age um, in, in uh, you know, in whatever he had been taught. And the, the reason why it's worth pausing here is uh, Buddha's life story is not just a historical account. It is also an allegorical account. It is, it is a teaching device. It makes teaching points. And uh, it also has some mythological aspects as well. And, you know, some people might feel, uh, you know, if, if this story is not real, then I'm not interested. But that would be throwing out the baby with the bathwater, because as I say, you know, this um, allegorical aspects, this mythological aspects, make profound points which will not come across if they were just put in black and white. And this is one such teaching point. And the point it is making is that, you know, we may know about many things in theory, but it is quite something to come up to actually come across it. We know that people have all sorts of problems and we're aware of them, but it's quite something else when we ourselves come across the problem. That's when it becomes alive. So we can assume that you know the prince was taught about old age, but when he but because he was sheltered, he had actually not come across uh, any old people. And on first encounter with an old person, it really shook him. Just like when we come across certain problems that we don't expect, they would shake us. So continuing with the story, the prince made two further um, trips to the town. And on the first of these further trips, he saw a sick man, unable to walk, and crying in pain and anguish. And on the second of, that, uh, of those two trips, he saw a corpse being taken for cremation. And each time, he was deeply shaken on learning that all, including himself, and the people he knew and loved were subject to old age, sickness, and death. 
However, on a fourth trip, he saw a wandering mendicant. And he learned from Chana, his trusted charioteer, that this person had given, the, given up the home life and, beca and become a mendicant to seek for, the tr for truth. And Buddha realized that the true happiness for him did not lie in the pleasures of the palace. And like the mendicant, he resolved to search the answer for deliverance from old age, sickness, and death, not only for himself, but for all beings. And also, perhaps we can also use this, uh, the, the um, fact of old age, sickness, and death as a shorthand for our suffering as well. You know, these days, perhaps, you know, we're not faced with death as, uh, as immediately as perhaps people in Buddha's time war, you know, we've had many medical advances and people generally live to ripe old age now. And generally when they do die, they perhaps do not die at home, they die in hospitals. So we're not confronted with death in the same way um, uh, as in Buddha's time. So perhaps, you know, old age, sickness and death uh, may not perhaps hold as much uh, of, uh, may, may not have as much of a hold on us uh, as it did on Buddha. But as I say, it is just as uh, shortened for change. You know, we are born, we, we become old, we die, and it is change that brings about our suffering. So old age, sickness, and death can be held to be a short end for our suffering, actually. So after the fourth trip, Buddha went back to the palace and he had resolved to uh, leave the palace and uh, become a mendicant. So at the age of 29, on the day that his wife had given birth to his, his son Rahul, Buddha left the palace in Hermit's Robe. And actually, even that bit, you know, hearing that Buddha left the palace on the day that his son was born might sound as shocking to us, but it's making another point that if we were to follow this path, it is going to take us a lot of courage, just like it would have taken with a, a lot of courage to, um, uh, to uh, leave the palace and leave his newly born son behind. You know, we can all relate to that, you know, a newborn son and we have to leave him, leave him behind. And, and that gives us the impact of, of what is required, the sort of determination and the courage that is actually required in following this path. Um, you know, um, a lot of people feel that, you know, if we just start uh, following Buddhism, you know, everything will become rose tinted, everything will be fine thereafter. But actually, once we start practicing, and if you are practice, practicing the path properly, actually, uh, things may actually, you know, the suffering may actually hit us more than uh, what it probably does, you know, before we've started on the practice. This is because we actually start working with suffering. We start looking into suffering, just like Buddha had the impact uh, on, on seeing the old man, the, the sick man, and the corpse, you know, things will hit us uh, when we start the practice. And it needs courage and determination to, to follow the path, actually. It doesn't become rose-tinted. And if, if everything lo looks rose-tinted, then something is wrong with the practice, actually. Um, you're not doing the practice properly or correctly. 
and and it should actually be done under the guidance of a teacher uh, who's qualified to guide us actually because there, there are a lot of things that we can misconstrue so after Buddha left the palace, he uh, became a mendicant and he found two well-respected teachers, one after the other, and he learned all that each of the teachers had to teach, reaching heights of meditation, uh, but you know, yet the teacher's teaching and meditation did not actually give him the final answer as to why there is suffering and what the way out of suffering is. And, you know, having attained proficiency under each teacher, you know, had learned uh, under each teacher what everything that each teacher had to teach, uh, and both the teachers, teachers had in turn asked Gautam to, to join them as a teacher. Uh, but Gautam declined because he was still searching for an answer to the world's suffering that would satisfy him. So he left uh, both the teachers, uh, one after the other, um, and, and next, uh, there was, and there still is in India, belief amongst many ascetics uh, that the final liberation can only be achieved through hardship. Uh, it can only be achieved by rigorous self-mortification. So Siddharth found five ascetics who were following this path, and he was firm in his practice. He lived on a few grains of rice. He wore rags. He slept on hard ground. And he struggled for several years without finding the answer to his search. So that slide shows the cave where the Buddha practiced his austerities, it is on the Buddhist pilgrimage route, and the, the Buddha Rupa, Rupa means a sculpture image, the Buddha Rupa there shows Buddha in this phase of his life where he was practicing uh, rigorous self-mortification. You can see that Buddha, the, you know, the ribs are uh, showing through, uh, you know, so he was near to starvation, um, he was near to death, and uh, and 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 the and uh, uh, Siddharth realized that you know follow continuing to follow this path is really just going to lead to his death without him having found the answer to as to why we suffer and the way out of suffering. Uh, so Gautam abandoned um, self-torture and fasting and took normal food. And he took a bathe in the river. So his five companions saw this. Uh, they saw that you know, he had taken a bath, he had taken uh, normal food. So they decided that um, uh, uh, Gautam uh, had given up um, his struggle for enlightenment and had taken to a life of luxury. So they decided to leave him. And so Gautam, um, on taking normal food and abandoning self-torture, eventually regained uh, his uh, former strength and um, we can call him the Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva means someone who uh, is on a path to enlightenment. So the Bodhisattva uh, uh, resolved 
to make his final search by his own strength and efforts in complete solitude because he had not found a teacher that had given him the answer or a path that had given him the answer. So he decided to look for the answer on his own efforts. And in the forenoon of the day before his enlightenment, while the Bodhisattva was seated under a Bodhi tree, Sujatha, a daughter of a rich householder, offered him some rice gruel that nourished him. And this was his last meal prior to his enlightenment. After taking that meal, uh, uh, the Bodhisattva sat in meditation, cross-legged, under the Bodhi tree, and he resolved not to get up till he attained full enlightenment. <clears throat> As the night drew on, the Bodhisattva entered successive stages of meditation, and on reaching the fourth and the highest stage of meditation, profound insights unfolded. And on seeing the morning star, the Bodhisattva became enlightened. And he can now be referred to as the Buddha. And the Buddha means the fully awakened one. So, Lavinia, if you can have the fifth slide, which is of the Mahabodhi temple. So, this is the Mahabodhi temple. So, this is at the place where Buddha attained enlightenment. And let me know if you can have the next slide. So uh, this is, you can see a tree uh, in the distance. So this is actually behind the, uh, the Mahabodhi temple. And there, so there is the, the Bodhi tree. It's not actually the same Bodhi tree uh, uh, as the tree under which Buddha obtained enlightenment but it is actually related to that tree in that when um, Buddhism uh, spread to Sri Lanka, a cutting of the original tree was taken to Sri Lanka and this tree is an offshoot from, from that. So, so this, Bodhi, this Bodhi tree is related to the original Bodhi tree. And let me know if, you could, if we can have the next slide. So this is the spot under the Bodhi tree, and this marks the spot where Buddha attained enlightenment. And it is, so this is all on the Buddhist pilgrimage circuit. Um, so for a period after his enlightenment, the Buddha sat at the foot of the Bodhi tree, experiencing the bliss of liberation and, re and revealing the insights that he had. And you know, some texts say that the period was one week, some others say it was seven weeks. But eventually, after, the, uh, after that period, he decided to communicate his discovery. And he realized that this truth that he's discovered is really very difficult to grasp. So he had a conundrum as to how to explain it. And he realized that he can start off by explaining it to, pe uh, to people, as it says, who had little dust covering their eyes. In, the, in other words, they had uh, already had, you know, uh, progressed some way along a religious path. Uh, and so he decided that the five ascetics that he was with were, would be able to understand the deep truth, the profound truth that he had discovered. And he so sought out the five uh, at a place called Deer Park, uh, at a place called Isipatna, which is in modern Sarnath, uh, which is near Varanasi in India. So when the five uh, ascetics saw uh, Buddha approaching them, he 
decided only, sorry, the, the five ascetics decided that they will uh, only show normal courtesies to the Buddha and would not have anything further to do with him because, you know, according to them, you know, Buddha had lapsed in his search for the truth. So, so they decided they will not really have anything further to do with Buddha beyond paying him normal respects. However, you know, as Buddha approached them, in spite of, you know, what they had said, Buddha's deep demeanor actually drew them in and they actually listened to the Buddha. And at first, the Buddha taught them the middle way. And the middle way is not to practice two extremes. And the true extremes are that of sensual indulgence on the one hand, and the other extreme is self-mortification on the other hand. And Buddha realized, you know, he'd been through both this. Uh, uh, he'd been through, you know, living a life of luxury and sensual indulgence, and that had not given him the uh, answer as to why we suffer. And on the other hand, self-mortification did not give him the answer as to why we suffer. And so the Buddha realized that the answer lay in, in following the middle way. And the middle way is in fact another name for Buddha's path. And in fact, the society's journal is actually called the middle way. And, you know, perhaps, you know, these days, more, mostly most of us will not actually follow a, a path of self-mortification, yet there are some who would. Uh, but, you know, a lot of us would definitely follow the path of sensual indulgence, and that is definitely not going to lead to um, the answer to our sufferings. Uh, uh, and so, so the, the message of the middle way is really quite useful. So the middle way between the extremes leads to calm and liberation. And the path of practice, uh, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, which we'll talk uh, uh, about in a subsequent talk, is this middle way. And after having taught the middle way to the five ascetics, the Buddha then taught them the four noble truths, which is one of the core teachings of Buddhism, which we, which we will also cover in a future talk. And thus, the Buddha set in motion the, the will of Dharma, the will of truth. And the five ascetics eventually gained enlightenment and became uh, his first disciples. Lavinia, could we have the uh, slide uh, number eight, the stupa as Sarnath? So, so the, this, this uh, structure is called stupa, and we find this in a lot of Buddhist countries. Stupa is basically, it actually represents a mound of earth under which are buried relics of, um, uh, of someone uh, who has achieved enlightenment and is following the path of truth, someone highly achieved. Uh, and we, find, we, we would find stupas all over Buddhist countries. And so this is the stupa at Sarnath. This is where the Buddha taught uh, his first teachings to the five. So this is at a museum in Sarnath. Um, and this, is, this shows uh, the image uh, uh, of Buddha teaching the four noble truths. In all, uh, Buddha's teaching career lasted 45 years, and the Buddha passed away at the age of 80 in a place called Kusinagar. Yes, so, so this is Nirvana Temple at Kusinagar, the place where Buddha passed away. And this is a reclining Buddha 
in the Nirvana temple at Kusinagar. Um, and it shows Buddha at, uh, at his last stages of life. So Buddhism is the truth that was discovered by Buddha and the path that leads to that truth. So we'll, uh, we'll next consider some of the features of Buddhism as a religion. The first feature is that in Buddhism, there is no creator God who transcends his creatures and his powers over them. Perhaps, uh, uh, say, we can contrast their, uh, this with uh, Christianity, where there is a definite idea of, of a God as a creator. So in Buddhism, there is no such thing as a creator God. Rather than that, in Buddhism, there is a natural law that is operating. And when we are not in harmony with that, that, with that natural law, we suffer. And when we function in accordance with that natural law, then we put an end to our suffering. And we'll discover what that natural law is in subsequent talks. This round of suffering that we are all enmeshed in is called samsara. This is our mundane world. It's called samsara in Sanskrit, which is one of the languages of Buddhism. And it's our ignorance of the way things really are that enmesh us in samsara. So what this means is that the way we see the world is somehow flawed. There, we, we have a little bit of a delusion about the way we th see things. And it is because of this ignorance of the way things really are that we are bound up in this samsara, this world of suffering. Enlight enlightenment or nirvana, nirvana is another word for enlightenment in Sanskrit, uh, is emerging from that ignorance and thus becoming free of that enmeshment uh, of what binds us in samsara. And this is summarized in Buddha's words, suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. Now, although Buddhism has no creator God, it is still a religion because it requires us to lay down a narrow ways of seeing and behaving uh, our all enveloping interest in ourselves, in I, in, uh, in me and mine for something that is greater than I, that is something that is beyond I. And, it, and that laying down is actually a religious act. It cannot be done uh, by an act of will, actually. It is actually a religious act. The other thing about Buddhism is that no one, not even Buddha, can grant us deliverance from the suffering just by begging for deliverance or by blind faith and just, uh, you know, just out of respect for Buddha's words, none of these things by themselves grant us deliverance. To, to gain deliverance, we have to walk the Buddha's path ourselves. It is said that Buddha but points the way, we, we have to walk it ourselves. So no one, no one can grant us deliverance, you know, by rituals or by superstitions or by sacrifices or just by simply just doing meditation 
um, for its own sake. Um, the, none of these things by themselves will grant us deliverance. Uh, we have to put in effort and energy, each one of us, if we are to gain liberation by following the path. And Buddhism does not require blind faith. It doesn't require compulsion or coercion. It calls for us to investigate the teachings for ourselves. You know, we take a small step, we take a first step uh, along Buddha's path, and we see it and we test it. And if it works, then we can take another step. So Buddha said that as the wise test gold by burning, by cutting, and by rubbing it on a touchstone, so are you to accept my words after examining them and not merely out of regard for me. So Buddha himself is saying, don't just believe it because I am saying it. Believe it because you've examined it, examined it, and you've seen it for yourself. And just to emphasize this point, we have this dialogue um, between Buddha and his disciples in, in, in the Buddhist canon. Uh, so Buddha, after giving his teachings, asks his disciples, if now knowing this, that's the teachings, if now knowing this, and preserving this, would you say we honor our master and through respect for him, we respect what he teaches? His disciples re replied, no, Lord. So Buddha continues, that which you aff affirm, O disciples, is it not only that which you yourselves have recognized, seen, and grasped? Yes, Lord say the disciples. So we have to test the teachings for ourselves and, and see it for ourselves that it works. Now I'll just read out another uh, a passage from one of the texts uh, which are uh, mentioned. The text is Piyadasi's Buddha's Ancient Path. So Piyadasi says, <clears throat> The Buddha never interfered with another man's freedom of thought. For freedom of thought is the birthright of every individual. It is wrong to coerce, sorry, it is wrong to force someone out of the way of life, which accords with his outlook and his character, with his spiritual inclinations and his tendencies. Compulsion in every form is bad. It is caution of the blackest kind to make a man swallow beliefs for which he has no relish. Such forced feeding cannot be good for anybody anywhere. So in Buddhism, you never see forced conversions or proselytizing. And Buddha also denounced adherence to unprofitable rites, rituals, and superstitions. Buddha's way cannot be understood by intellectual study only. In the West, we are very intellectual and we believe that if only we read enough books, we will come to understand Buddhism. Buddha's insight can never be realized by book learning or alone. I think I'm on safe grounds to say that no one has reached enlightenment by just reading about Buddhism. Study and practice have to balance each other 
for true insight to arise. And in fact, you know, we've seen an example of that in Buddha's life. You know, Buddha would have been aware of old age, sickness and death since he was being trained to become a world ruler. And it'd be really surprising if he did not intellectually know about this. But, you know, to know it for oneself when one comes face to face with it is something else. And we find this time and time again in practice, you know, we, we, you know, we read something in Buddhism and we say, yes, that, that's nice, it makes sense, etc. And we go on to the next thing. And really, uh, you, know, you know, the thing that we've read about will only start opening up when through our practice we actually see um, examples of that opening up in our, in our own lives. Another thing, uh, another feature of, of uh, Buddhism is that Buddha's teach, in Buddha's teaching, uh, no attempt is made to probe into ultimate origin of man and things, you know, um, like why, um, so, you know, for example, you know, how did universe come into existence? Is universe finite or is it infinite? You know, people, some people have this idea that, you know, Buddhism uh, is about answering all those questions. And Buddha quite categorically say that, you know, his, uh, the solutions to these met metaphysical questions will not free man from suffering. Um, so he always hesitated to answer metaphysical questions when asked about that. And Buddha's only concern was to explain suffering and the way out of suffering. Now, it is true that as we practice Buddhism, we will get insight into uh, 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 true reality, and that might give us a different picture as to uh, uh, as to you know what what universe is uh, 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 so so you know but these are all incidental things uh, um, the, the 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 real quest for 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 Buddhism is the answer to our suffering. Um, in Buddhism, there are two main branches. Uh, or you can say two main schools. Uh, uh, of Buddhism, uh, 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 there there is Theravada Buddhism. So when uh, 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 after Buddha's uh, teaching, the teachings spread southwards to uh, Sri Lanka, and then on to Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and South Vietnam. So this. This teaching that went southwards is um, Theravada Buddhism. And the other branch of Buddhism uh, is, are the teachings that went northwards uh, from India. So Mahayana spread north from India to, uh, to Tibet, Mongolia, China, Korea, Japan, and North Vietnam. And uh, that is Mahayana Buddhism. Now, our, our talks uh, in the first five weeks, including this week, are mainly based on the Theravada teachings. But in the sixth week, we will then go on to Mahayana teaching uh, uh, and uh, you know, see you know, the, uh, the subtle difference that, uh, that arose. Uh, with Mahayana. Uh, the two main languages of uh, Buddhism are Sanskrit and Pali. Uh, and generally, Theravada Buddhist uh, literature is in Pali. And Mahayana literature was originally in Sanskrit, but mostly all the Sanskrit uh, writings have been lost. Uh, and our um, uh, source of Mahayana teachings mainly now comes from Tibetan and Chinese sources, which were uh, the, and they were actually derived from the original Sanskrit um, writings or teachings. 
so, um, and I'll use uh, both Pali and Sanskrit terms uh, because sometimes there is no exact uh, translation for um, some of the uh, Pali and Sanskrit words in English. So it's more convenient to just learn this Pali or Sanskrit word and, and understand, you know, what they mean. So that brings us uh, to the end of today's uh, uh, course. We've got a few minutes. Uh, you know, people are welcome to ask questions. I can't see all the screens, but uh, if you want to ask us a question, you know, unmute, unmute yourself because I think you might all be on mute. And Lavinia, if you notice anything on chat uh, as questions, uh, that uh, then you can uh, uh, pass them on to me uh, j just by raising them. Uh, I, I, I won't be reading a chat just now, just right now when I'm answering the questions. So if anyone has a question, you do unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is William from Vancouver, Canada. Good evening. Well, hello. Um, thank you for this, this very uh, entertaining lecture and quite enlightening for me as an introduction. It was my first time taking a formal course. I just have a question on semantics, perhaps. So yeah. in the beginning of the talk, you started by stating that Buddhism is a religion. Yeah. And towards the end, um, I did gather quite delightfully that it is an endeavor to inquiry. Yeah. where we inquire uh, using free thinking and um, an open mind and so forth. So yeah. in what sense is it a religion? Yes. So um, uh, it's a religion because uh, it, we have to let go of I, myself, uh, you know, belief in ourselves as the supreme things in this universe and we have to uh, let go of that to, to, to knowledge that is transcendental. In other words, that knowledge cannot be acquired by, uh, by just intellectual understanding alone. And, and to, uh, to, to acquire that understanding, it requires us to lay down ourselves for something greater. And, and that laying down ourselves for something greater is a religious act uh, because it's not being done intellectually. Uh, we're looking to something greater than I or ourselves. Um, now, you know, the, it might seem that this conflicts with something else that I say, where I say that, you know, test it for yourselves before you believe in it. And yet, you are here being asked to make that leap uh, into something that you may not actually know. Uh, and in fact, you know, it is, it is a new discovery uh, beyond in, uh, that goes beyond intellect. Uh, uh, and the way to resolve that is that, you know, little by little by practicing uh, Buddhism, we gain faith in the teachings uh, by testing it out for ourselves. And, and, you know, as, as we progress, you know, that faith becomes solid and then we can make that leap. So there is no contradiction between testing things for ourselves and making that leap. And even when, they, when we make that leap and we see things, we can still see, the, we can still see whether, you know, we can, we can still examine it for ourselves uh, and see whether, um, you, you know, is it misleading us or not. Thank you. Any other questions? So I may have some questions for you in the chat, Rohit. Yes, please do. So let's read the first one from Rachel. Yes. Uh, so after the Buddha left his wife and son, aged 29, how long was it until he achieved enlightenment? Uh, six years is what the texts say. So he achieved enlightenment at the age of 35. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Lavinia, were there okay. any other questions? Yes. On the so, Carry on. Uh, Khan asks, Hi, may I ask a question? Is the Buddha a real person existing in history? Uh, we can think uh, of him similarly to Jesus as a real person. Yes, um, yes, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, there was a, a real person, Buddha, who actually lived two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, because, you know, there, there's a lot of evidence, a lot of, uh, you know, archaeological sites, you know, some of the pictures that we saw of, um, you know, where he was born, uh, where he achieved enlightenment, where he passed away, all these, uh, you, you know, have uh, all these sites exist. Uh, you know, through, through archaeological surveys uh, uh, as well. So, you know, we, we can be confident that there was a historic person who lived uh, um, uh, and discovered uh, Buddhism. However, um, do bear in mind uh, what I said earlier, that, you know, the accounts that we hear of, uh, uh, of Buddha's life, uh, you know, in Buddhist texts, is a mixture of historical accounts plus allegorical accounts plus mythological accounts and they all serve certain purpose and you know uh, uh, I think we can say similar uh, similarly about Jesus's life where Jesus uh, I, th I think um, uh, has been uh, is generally accepted was a historical person uh, but then there are many many aspects of his life which uh, are go into mythological uh, territory, you know, for example, his rising from the cross. And they all have a deep, deep teaching uh, uh, purpose behind them. So uh, to answer the question, yes, there was a historical person called Buddha, uh, but the accounts are just not, his, uh, just not simply just historical account, but they are not worth any less for that. Thank you. So we have another question from Khan. Uh, when can a person call herself a Buddhist? Um, well, once you start practicing Buddhism, and we will we'll be to, uh, talking about practicing Buddhism, I, th I think, to my mind, that is when you can start calling yourself uh, a, a Buddhist. Although, you know, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a loose term, uh, you, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I can gain, give a definite answer. Uh, you know, it's, if you, you know, if you, if you believe in Buddha, uh, um, if, if, you, if you're willing to bow to Buddha as a teacher, I suppose, then, then you can call yourself Buddhist as well. Uh, I think it's difficult to answer, but I think you will know, your, you, you will know for yourself uh, whether you're a Buddhist or not. Uh, once you go into the teachings and uh, whether you're, you know, following them, whether they, whether they speak to you or not, uh, uh, I think you'll discover the answer for yourself. Thank you. Can I go on? Yeah, please We do. have another two questions here from Shami. The yeah. first one, was Siddhartha Gautama born a Hindu? And if so, why did he not accept this religion? Right. Um, uh, yes, uh, I, I think we, uh, we can assume that he was born a Hindu uh, because that was the religion that would have practiced uh, at that time. Uh, and H Hinduism is an ancient religion uh, and it's still practiced in India, but you know, it, it's probably evolved uh, since with us time uh, as well. Um, so, uh, why, so the question was why, uh, why did he not believe or, or find the answer from the two teachers that he uh, went to? Is that, is that, sorry? Why, yeah, if so, why he did not accept uh, the, the religion he was born into, so Hinduism. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, um, so, you know, he went to those two teachers who taught him everything that Hinduism had to teach, uh, teach him at that time. Uh, but it simply did not give him the answer as to, uh, uh, well, the ultimate answer as to why we suffer. He, he reached, you know, he reached quite high levels 
of understanding of Hinduism. And that, that would have told him, you know, uh, uh, a lot about life, suffering, death. Yet there was something that was missing from, what he, from the answer that he was able to get. And it was that something that was missing that he was looking for, something that would take him beyond, completely beyond samsara. And uh, Hinduism did not give him that answer. Thank you. And sorry, if I can just add, uh, so in Buddhism, you know, uh, sorry, in Hinduism, there is a, a belief in a soul. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, Buddhism, there is no belief in a soul. There is no such thing as a soul. So this is where the critical point of the difference between the two comes in. And, you know, while there is a belief in, in something, uh, whether you call it a soul or whether you call it something, then there is something there, but everything is subject to change. And that belief in soul, uh, uh, Buddha so, was still not the answer because, you know, everything is subject to change. Uh, uh, and, and, and so belief in soul did not give a final permanent answer. And he only found final permanent answer to going beyond soul and so there is in in buddhism where um, uh, if i talk in terms of mahayana mahayana uh, enlightenment is emptiness uh, sunyata which is another word for emptiness and empty emptiness is means nothing but uh, here uh, i have to take care as well because it does not mean a black void it means that everything exists, but you cannot point to it and say whether this exists or does not exist, actually. So everything, so uh, in other words, we can say that everything is straddling between existence and non-existence. And as long as we, uh, so, uh, so as long as we hold on to a belief of soul, then there is a belief that there is something existing and in, in Buddhism, the, the ultimate truth is that there is no self-abiding thing that exists forever. And, and that's the point of difference between Hinduism and, and, and Buddhism. Uh, and uh, 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 and I'll, I'll just say again, although I'm, I, you know, it's emptiness. Um, uh, emptiness means uh, doesn't mean a black void. Emptiness simply means that you cannot say whether something exists. You cannot say that it does not exist because as soon as you start saying that something exists, that is still you, you're giving it something definite. Or if you, or it's uh, 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 or on the other end, if you say that something does not exist, then you're still saying something definite, which. Uh, is uh, counter to the truth that Buddha discovered. It, so in other words, the truth that he discovered goes beyond our everyday concepts and thoughts. Um, and, and, uh, and therefore, belief in soul uh, is not the final answer. Um, sorry to give that long-handed ans uh, answer, but uh, um, the, uh, you know, that's where, uh, uh, that is why Buddha's quest carried on after the two Hindu teachers. So we have another question here from Shami. Yeah. Is enlightenment the same as happiness? Uh, well, again, you know, if you are clinging to something, you're, uh, be it happiness, you're still clinging to something. Enlightenment goes beyond all these concepts. So it goes beyond suffering and also it goes beyond happiness, which is not to say that there are moments of joy uh, in our lives, but those moments of joy are also passing. And if we hold on to that, and, th and if that's what we call happiness, 
then that's not what Buddha, that's not what Buddha taught uh, is the answer. It's a, so, uh, so it depends on what you mean by happiness. Uh, if, you, if you mean by happiness, just joy in participation with everything as it is, then yes, that, that is, that is um, uh, the path. But, you know, when we use the word like happiness, we all uh, put our own ideas onto it. And that is not uh, what, what uh, uh, enlightenment is. Enlightenment is actually beyond words. Any word that you put on it limits it. It's, it's beyond limit. And hopefully as we go on the teachings, you know, you might get an inkling of what, what that is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question here from yeah. Kenny. From? Kenny? Yes. So if one does not yet believe in rebirth, would the idea of freedom of thought being the birthright of every individual mean someone can practice Buddhism without believing in rebirth? Yes. Um, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, as I say, in Buddhism, we take one step at a time. If it makes, uh, if it makes sense, uh, then uh, we take the next uh, step. Now, these uh, ideas of rebirth are really, really difficult to, to understand. Uh, but if we do practice uh, uh, um, diligently, you know, we do come across this. And you know, the answers might be surprising uh, as to what rebirth is, what life and death is. Um, uh, and uh, the problem with uh, to talking about rebirth and, and uh, saying that I'll only believe in Buddhism if, uh, uh, but I won't believe in rebirth, is we are casting something aside, which we do not yet understand, but in fullness of time, if we, if we, if we keep on following Buddhism, it will uh, uh, open up. But, uh, you know, the ideas that we have to start with as to what they are, are actually misleading ideas. Uh, and it is, uh, and when we actually discover what uh, what life and death is, and, and what rebirth is, it is something that is is actually something really surprising, uh, and something that you, you know, if people follow the path, they will come to that understanding eventually. Um, so, so the answer, um, in short, is take one step at a time. Don't discard the whole thing just because something that you don't understand now um, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense. You know, if your first initial steps make sense, then take the next step. Eventually, you know, you'll get deeper and deeper into the teachings, and eventually, all the teachings will open up. Okay, Lavinia, is there any? Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So we have another here from uh, Bruno. Uh, so right, uh, you say that enlightenment or freedom from suffering is necessarily a religious experience as opposed to a willful experience. Yeah. Why does uh, you consider that freedom from suffering must be a religious experience as opposed to a philosophical one? Um, well, I'm simply talking about... Um, uh, Buddha's path, and in, in Buddha's uh, path, it, it, it is not an intellectual understanding uh, that uh, um, enlightenment is. You know, uh, I mean, as a, as a short example, a small example, I gave how um, understanding something intellectually is quite different from actually coming face to face with something, uh, and, 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 then, and, and then a new understanding arises. Now, when we understand things philosophically, uh, we are understanding it only through our intellectual apparatus, so to speak. And um, uh, there's a limit to uh, how far our intellectual understanding takes us. The thing is, when we understand things intellectually, we, under we only understand it 
in the framework that our intellect has built up. Our, uh, so it may have been through habit, it may have been through learning from our parents, it may have been through our schooling, it may have been through our reading, it may, uh, but in the end, it is, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is framed within that framework. And that framework itself is self-limiting. And Buddha's path has to go beyond that. And, and that is why Buddha's path, in Buddha's path, enlightenment is a religious experience. It's not simply a philosophical um, experience. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you, Rahit. We have another question here yeah. from yeah. Trish. Yeah. Uh, could you please explain what Buddhist deities are? Okay, Buddhist de deities. Um, so, uh, um, okay, so we might talk about uh, some of them in, in future talks. So, uh, uh, these, uh, particularly in Mahayana, which is um, the one that I'm more familiar with, you know, there, there are Buddha, Buddha of compassion, there's Buddha of wisdom. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, and we'll come across all this in, in our teaching. So, there, so you can say that these, these deities represent particular qualities uh, of, you know, of compassion, of wisdom. Uh, so that's what they represent. Yeah. Any other questions, Lavinia? Yes. Another question from Bruno. Right. So uh, you say that there is no God creator in Buddhism. Yeah. Does Buddhism believe that there is a God? who is not necessarily the creator. Um, yes, so, uh, okay, so it depends what you mean by God who's not a creator. There is, uh, uh, again, you know, as we go, we, we'll come across uh, term devas. Uh, um, uh, devas, uh, sometimes it's translated as, as gods with a small g. Uh, and uh, when, particularly when we, explore a teaching called the wheel of life there's a realm in the wheel of life called the realm of the gods which is the realm of the devas so these uh, gods are uh, th you know through merit merit uh, through uh, through merit that they've accumulated through practice you know they're highly they've achieved qu quite quite a lot they are in a happy state um, uh, and uh, so, the, so they are gods in that they are in a happy state. They are uh, they live they lead long lives. They have no worries. Uh, but uh, the, this state is still within samsara. Uh, uh, so it is an impermanent state, and and therefore it's uh, it's still not the state that we aim to be in. So. So to answer the question, you know, you'll come across the term gods in this sense in Buddhism. Uh, um, but otherwise, you know, it depends, you know, what the question means by the term God. Okay, then we have a comment from Sandra who uh, says, thanks for this very interesting talk. Uh, looking forward to the future talks which is amazing. Yeah. And then we have another question here yeah. from Rachel. Is there an equivalent to a baptism christening for Buddhism? Okay, uh, okay. so to answer the question, um, uh, you know, Buddhism, uh, what, what's happened with Buddhism? As Buddhism has gone to different cultures, you know, to, to Sri Lanka, Thailand, Tibet, Mongolia, Buddhism is actually a very flexible religion. It's adapted to local culture and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, the life markers, you know, things like baptism, marriage ceremonies, etc. you know, they have followed more of the cultural context as to where it's ended up 
and it may still be done as a Buddhist ceremony, but there is no one set way of doing all these things in all the Buddhist worlds. So, you know, Buddhism, uh, as I say, is very flexible, it's adapted itself, and, and, and all these rites that are marked all take different forms in different countries. And certain, certain rites, for example, in Japan, um, marriages are conducted in front of Shinto shrines. Uh, so, so although, you know, people may be Buddhist, they, they, they still believe in Shintoism and they, the, uh, you know, marriages would be conducted uh, in, in front of a Shinto uh, shrine. So, uh, so, you know, it varies uh, between country to country, culture to culture. Any other questions? Yes, we have uh, two other questions. The yeah. first one is, uh, again, a question from Bruno. Yeah. Um, so I appreciated uh, uh, Mr. Shah's recounting of Gautama's life. Uh, I have heard other slightly different versions. Yeah. One says that as a Hindu, Gautama saw Kali during his self-mortification. And Kali said to Gautama, Stop this foolish self mortification. This is not where you will find enlightenment. And upon that vision, Gotama gave up his self mortification. Have you heard this account? I personally haven't come across this account. And it is true that there are uh, various different um, accounts in Buddhism. You know, for example, I say, you know, some accounts say, you know, Buddha spent one week uh, after enlightenment, you know, reviewing his insight some say seven weeks. So there are different accounts, uh, which is not to say that any of these are worse or better than any others. They're all just a, you know, uh, giving um, uh, with us life in, from slightly different perspectives maybe. And, you know, this uh, account of, of uh, Kali is very interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, the way I read it, I mean, this is the first time I, I, I'm hearing about it. The way I would read it, is that this insight about giving up the uh, 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 path of self-mortification rose in Buddha uh, as, um, as, as an insight. And, and sometimes, you know, insights are, are, are so profound and so powerful that sometimes they are put in the mouth of, uh, of certain gods or, uh, or perhaps Take, uh, uh, some, some of them are spoken of as if from a heavenly realm. So, so these are sort of different accounts uh, trying to portray a deep truth and giving it, you know, a deep significance. Uh, so, um, you know, that's how I would understand. Uh, and, you know, so yes, there, there, there might be this particular account, which I personally haven't come across. But thank you for that. Thank you. So we have one last question here yeah. from Hannah. Yeah. I think you mentioned that it's important to have a teacher. Yeah. Please, could you talk a bit more about that? How does the teaching relationship work? Yes, uh, this, this is a really, really difficult one. Um, you know, uh, you, to, to really progress on Buddha's path, you do need a teacher. Uh, and a teacher who has been through the practice themselves. And, uh, and, and when I say teacher, um, not someone like myself who's simply just teaching this course. So I'm not using teacher in that sense. Um, I'm, I'm talking about teacher who has been through the practice and, and has uh, achieved high levels of understanding and could be held up as an example of Buddha's teaching, you know, his whole life is an example of Buddha's teaching. So that's the sort of teacher who one should look for in guidance. Now, it's, it's, it is difficult to find that. Uh, you know, there are many, many good teachers. There are many, many groups led by good teachers. On the other hand, there are a few charlatans as well. So, you know, you have to be careful uh, and uh, yeah, it's something we, uh, we have to struggle with. You know, if you are in London, you, if you're part of the society, you know, there are uh, 
uh, uh, classes in different traditions, you know, Tibetan, uh, um, uh, Theravada, Zen, which are led by teachers, you know, who, you know, I can say are, are, are kosher, uh, who've been through the traditional training. Uh, so, uh, you know, through the Buddhist society, you, you may be able to find some teachers if you are, you know, living in another country, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, hopefully, you know, you'll have to search for and find. So, Lavinia, sh shall we call that at the end or, is there, or shall we have one last question? So, I think that any further question uh, uh, will be shared next week. Okay, so um, that brings us to the end of today's talk and uh, we'll uh, meet again next Tuesday at 6.30. Till then, have a good week. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>